when you think about your life, day after day, week after week, year after year, and you, you can start to do a few things. Uh, there's a, 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 a hymn song called Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. I'll tell you what, when, when I hear that song, Praise the King, you praise Him in the good and you praise Him in what you consider in yourself the bad. And by that I mean this, God takes us every step of the way. Ooh, every step of the way. Praise the Lord. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Just got to go with it on that one. Good or bad, you praise the King. Uh, uh, years ago, I saw this one movie, actually taught on it, uh, in, in a youth group uh, called Facing the Giants. It was a football football movie of a high school team. Um, very had a lot of inspirational parts. It was it was a Christian film. One of the things that the coach did that totally turned around the team. And then I'm going to get into my thought process for this morning though is this: that he told the kids, no matter what takes place, if we win a game, we'll praise the Lord. If we lose a game. We will praise the Lord. And that little thought process, it began to change the hearts of the students. They started to become, that's when you meld in a relationship of a team and stuff like that. Now with that thought process, know this. When you praise God for all things, good, what we consider bad, good things, whatever, you start to think on God. He has this thing that melds with us in this relationship. Praise the King. Amen. Now I'm going to get into this morning. This morning's message I was kind of joking around a little bit with Pastor Mark this morning. It is about, it is, well, it is Valentine's. Happy Valentine's to all of you, every one of you. And I can say that because I know this, because what I'm going to speak upon, it, it deals with the love of God, okay? But I'm in an area, and if you like, you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29. And you can, I'm not going to say follow along, because I'm going to do what I did uh, last week or so. I'm going to tell a story of what taking place, what's taking place here in Ge Genesis chapter 29. It is about, are you ready? It is about love. It is about sex. It is about deceit and trickery. It is about death. And of all things, it is about God being in the midst of all of it. Wow, it's almost like a romance no novel. Let me tell you this. If you were to completely read line for line in this area, the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Laban, the father-in-law, when you start to read in this story, you're going to see everything found in, 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 in a, a, a novel. Here's how the love story goes. Jacob. He arrives in the land of his ancestors and he's bringing along with him his, you know, his people and he's bringing along his entourage and he's bringing along his, his cattle and, and here's what takes place when you're running, when you're walking through the desert and you're driving your cattle, you got to do what? You got to give him something to drink and he comes upon the, in, in this land, he comes upon this well and as he comes up to it, the well has this big old rock over it. It's sealed. And he's like, you know what? I need to water my cattle, you know? And so he begins to have conversation with the individuals at this well. And they're like this, well, you know what? And this is really kind of freaky. We can't water the cattle until everyone gets here. It's kind of like this time clock thing. We wait for everyone to arrive. And then we together, we lift off the rock. And then we water all of our flocks, and then we go about our business after that. But we gotta wait till everyone gets here. And Jacob's like, say what? <laughs> what do you mean? In fact, Jacob has a, a line in, in the area of text here in chapter 29. He's like this. Well, you look around. It's still a lot of daylight. A lot of daylight left. If we would water the cattle, we could keep on moving on. Why am I wasting time sitting here? But he doesn't waste time. He continues to talk to the guys that are hanging out at the watering hole, the water cooler, if you would, okay? And as he sees there, he sees this young lady coming up. With her, and she, she is uh, uh, the shepherd girl. She has her flock that she's bringing to the watering hole. And as he's looking, he falls, it's like he, he, he falls in love with her. He sees her coming. Now I want you to know this is how it is. 
You have Jacob who's at this well. You have the one who is walking up, which is Rachel. Rachel is the younger daughter of this story. And the older daughter is Leah. And the dad of the daughters is Laban. And they are, in, they are connected as it is his ancestors. And that's how the conversation takes place. He goes, you know, do you know this Laban guy? How's he doing? You know, just small talk. Small talk around the water cooler. How's, how's Laban doing? Things are going well. Looks like the cattle's doing pretty good. Whoa. Here's the romance. In chapter 29, started at verse 16, it says this. Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. But Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. Jacob, he's in love. Let me, let me translate it into the Brent talk here for a moment. She's a fox. She's fine. Do you see that chick coming up? She's it. I'm in love. Love at first sight. She's a babe. In fact, he gives her a kiss as he introduces himself. And then, I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. <laughs> now, it might be in one of those, you know, uh, over, over in, in that kind of area. You know, they, they do the, almost like the French kiss, 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 you know. Glad to see you, glad to meet you. But it was more for him. He was in love with Rachel. After all, scripture says she had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. And then, and then let me translate because they nicely put it. She has no spark. Leah had no sparkle in her eyes ugly no, I'm just kidding <laughs> I'm just there was something in Jacob's mindset that Leah was not it it was Rachel that was beautiful in his, and he fell in love with her are you ready because when, when I'm reading the text there in chapter 29 what does it say I will work for you Laban seven years if you will give me Rachel your younger daughter as my wife are you ready for the aww oh, moment because it says here in, in chapter 29, it says this. Because for Jacob, he says to Laban this. Man, to work for you seven years, it is nothing but a few days for me to have Rachel. Oh, that's just so beautiful. You know, see, guys don't know. Pick, you know if you want some pickup lines, you, you got to go to the scriptures. <laughs> and so there's this all moment. Man. To wait for you seven years, Rachel, it's like a few days. I can do this. Why? I'm so in love with you. But then there's trickery. Because the deal is made. Laban's like this. Yeah, Jacob. He looks, see, you got to picture the scene. Jake, uh, Leah, uh, excuse me, uh, Laban, the father-in-law, looks at, at Jacob and says, you know what? Another strong body for seven years? Boom. We'll be doing really good. And so he makes this deal with him for the seven years. But what he does is he, in the night, the wedding night, he sends Leah, the one with no sparkle in her eye, into Jacob's tent. And Jacob sleeps with Leah. And as it goes, Leah then becomes his wife because of what has taken place. And Jacob the next morning wakes up and the one with no sparkles like next to him and he is upset with Laban and Laban's like this well I'll tell you what see this is the trickery the, the deceit if you will work for me another seven years I will give you Rachel as my daughter as your wife and the reason being it so he and he has this excuse for his trick because you know in our land we don't give the, the younger away first. It has to be an order of marriage. So we had to give you Leah first. But you work for me another seven years, you can have Rachel. Laban has now made a deal for a 14-year contract to get Rachel. And here is, uh, you know what? The, the relationship kind of goes... Uh, a little bit bad, if you can imagine. Genesis chapter 29, I'm at verse 28. It says this. 
So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. Are you ready? A week after Jacob had married Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. Laban gave Rachel a servant, Beliah, to be her maid. So Jacob slept with Rachel too. And he loved her more than Leah. He stayed and worked for Laban for an additional seven years. Can you kind of see the picture here? Here we have where he marries Leah, no sparkle, and a week after the wedding, he gets Rachel as part of this deal. And the scripture says he loved Rachel more. Now, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a girl, but all I can see is a cat fight. I'm sorry. Excuse me? I had him first. Now, I might not have no sparkle, but I had him first. And only a week, and now he's got this, he's got you, Rachel. I can just see separate tents. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, some of you are like, nah, nah, nah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's a cat fight. <laughs> Thank you. It's a cat fight that would take place. Why? Because he expressed how much more he loved her. Now, let me tell you this. Help me out here if I'm wrong in, in this sense. If a guy tells a woman in front of another woman how much more he loves her, you think she's not going to have her feelings hurt? You think she's not going to feel this unloved attitude that's toward her? So now we have the rift between the two ladies. Now here it is in this story. It gets kind of... Why would you even think this way, Leah? Leah has this thought process in Genesis chapter 29. I know what I can do. She might be pretty, but I bet you I can work hard enough on this love relationship. He will love me. Jacob will love me. All I got to do, and especially in the thought process of, of, the, of the scriptures, um, if I could just give him a son, he will love me way more than Rachel, especially if I give him a son first. Think about it. See, some of y'all have never had cat fights before. You don't know the difference between first and last. When you're first, man, first is first. They're the best, number one. And so Leah's like this. If I could just, just win his relationship, just win his love. And let me slow down for a sec. Because a lot of times today, this is how people have a thought process with God. You know what? If I could just do this for God, I will win God's love for me. If I could just do this for God, he will love me more. No matter how much my life does not sparkle, God will love me more. I can win him over. We have that thought process. And so just like Leah here, it goes like this, starting at verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he enabled her to have children. But Rachel could not conceive. Let me slow you. See, I want you to see. This is how I see this cat fight. One can conceive, which is really good, and one cannot. One has no sparkle, but man, she can have children. And one is beautiful and cannot. And it goes like this, and it continues to say this. So Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said... The Lord has noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. Are you understanding this part of winning the relationship over? He doesn't love me, and I have given him Reuben, and now he will love me. Guess what? It doesn't play, it doesn't play out that way. Soon she became pregnant again and gave birth to another son. She named him Simeon, for she said... The Lord heard that I was unloved and has given me another son. Are you? Here's, I know I can win his love because God's here in my misery. That man does not love me. Now I've given him two sons. And remember along, Rachel still has not given birth. Then it goes on. Verse 34. Then she, began, then she became pregnant a third time. And gave birth to, ready, another son, if you hadn't guessed. His name was Levi. For she said, surely this time 
my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. Are you understanding what I'm talking about this? I can win over his love and surely he will show me his affection. No. Let's continue on. Verse 35. Once again, what do you think I'm going to say? She's pregnant. She's pregnant. Okay, I'm just making sure we're all on this page of I can win him over. Once again, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to what? A son. Another son. And she named him Judah. For she said, now I will praise the Lord. And then guess what? And then she stopped having babies. And, 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 and I'm going to say this because I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. It had nothing to do with I will win his affection. It had nothing to do with, you know, J Jacob's going to love me. I have now given him this many sons and Jacob is going to love me. It has nothing to do with it. She just went, you know what? God has heard my cry, has heard my cry. Now, I don't know what's up with Jacob, but God has seen me and heard me in my misery. I will praise the Lord with Judah. Now, Judah, this is going to be important down the road. Remember Judah. But here's the thing in the chapter. The drama continues. Can you believe there's drama in women's lives? Come on, ladies. <laughs> and I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying, because let me help you here. Because this is how us guys have learned how to have drama. <laughs> we have learned, trust me, there's guys with drama too. But here's how the drama plays out right here. Rachel is not getting pregnant and Leah is not getting pregnant. So what do they do? For some reason, they come with this game plan. You know, here's, here's, I just know what I can do. I'm going to give Jacob a servant. <laughs> and that way she'll give him some children, but it'll be from me because I gave him to her or gave her to him. And so they, they come up with this game plan. So what do they do? Both ladies are at this, this game of I'll give her give I'll give her to him and I'll give her to him and she's going to have a son which she does and Leah's servant has a son and then Rachel's servant has another son and another son to where we get the 12 tribes okay I just want you to start I'm not going to list them but they are listed Dan and Gad and all they're all listed of all the, these, these servant ladies that are giving kids to Jacob more and more descendants and the cat fight does not stop Okay, there's no winning the affection. There's nothing. There's still this one, especially Leah, who is unloved. But there's a lot of kids now. You remember the first one I rattled off? Leah, she gave birth to the son first. His name was Reuben. Reuben, Genesis chapter, I've moved over to Genesis chapter 30 now. Genesis chapter 30, um, and I'm in the ver verse 14 area. Man, Hollywood can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Reuben, the oldest son, he's out and about during the wheat harvest. And, and, he's, and he's walking around and he comes across, and it must be something special. He comes across, and I, I shouldn't have looked it up, I'm sorry I didn't. He just came across these mandrakes. I don't really know what a mandrake is, but I know from the story, they must be something. <laughs> because Reuben takes these mandrakes, it's like, because it is February 14th, and I'm going to tell you, because I already know, I, I, I drove that way down Sentinella. I know that if you go down by Metro PCHS or whatever it is, there's two guys out there with roses. That's something. <laughs> there must have been something about these mandrakes, because he picks them and he takes them to his mama, Leah. Mom, here you go. Some mandrakes. Look, check out these mandrakes, Mom. I got them for you. And, and so Leah's like this. She's taking in these mandrakes, and here's what happened. Remember I said the cat fight continues. All of a sudden, Rachel comes up and looks at Leah. Where'd you get the mandrakes? Could, could I have some of the mandrakes? And, and here's where you understand the cat fight. Because uh, in one of the verses right there, following verse 14 and stuff, is this. Leah replies to the request from Rachel for the mandrakes. Woman, first of all, you take my man. You take him away from me, and now you want my mandrakes? And I don't, I don't comprehend this very well, but there must have been some, some good mandrakes to compare him to Jacob. Because she's like, first you take my man, Jacob, and now you want my mandrakes. 
And out of this little story here, Rachel and I could just kind of see them staring at each other. And then Leah comes up with her own plan. And so, or excuse me, Rachel's like this. They, they, I'm telling you, they were special mandrakes. Because Rachel goes, Leah, if you give me a mandrake, I'll let you sleep with Jacob. <laughs> and thank you for shaking your head. That must have been some special mandrakes. Leah says, to, Rachel says to Leah, if you, if you will give me those mandrakes, some mandrakes, I will let you sleep with Jacob. And so what does Leah do? No sparkle in her eye. Remember what I said, always trying to win the affection of Jacob. Oh, yeah, here you go. There's some mandrakes. Jacob, she got, read this text, read the text. Jacob, you're with me tonight, buddy. <laughs> and then she has another kid. The story goes a whole nother way from there. Okay, there's a lot that takes place. A lot that takes place with there. But I want to tell you this. With Rachel, just so I can start to connect this up. Rachel, she had two sons that we remember quite often. One would be, are you ready? Joseph. Joseph and the coat of many colors. I, I understand that, man, because then this, this whole story starts to really play out a certain way. Jacob. Because we preached on this. Remember when we talked about Joseph getting sold? His brothers wanted to kill him. <laughs> All the older ones that I was just mentioning wanted to kill Joseph. Why? Because Jacob loved Joseph. Here's the coat, my man. There you go. I love you. But then also know this. Because the one behind Joseph was Benjamin. Rachel had Joseph and Rachel had Benjamin. And those were Jacob's favorite sons. So... <laughs> Man, not only does he not love me, but he loves Rachel's two boys more than any of them that I have given. I tried winning his love, and I have failed. Here's what takes place in the stories. Rachel dies. Rachel actually dies during childbirth of Benjamin. So under, understand this, that was it Benjamin? That, that what's taking place here is Jacob is losing the one that when he saw her at the well, saw this beautiful woman that he loved so much, and now she's gone. And then there's a all then there's a story of Joseph and, and that. All that takes place. Uh, Leah, excuse me, Rachel is laid to rest. She's buried. But that doesn't bury the love that Jacob had for her. And so think about this. It doesn't, it doesn't really go into to such detail. But we do know this about Leah. Nothing is said of how the affection of Jacob ever changed for her. Nothing. All we know is this, in chapter 49, that when Leah did die, and we don't know when, but when Leah did die, she was just placed next to Jacob in burial. That's all we know. So for me, I'm like, man, I, I don't see anywhere where, where, where Leah ever, ever won the affection of Jacob. No matter what she did, she could not win over his love. But this is what I do know. Remember I told you that Jacob loved the two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. They were his favorites. Let me go back to where I told you how when, uh, when Leah was having babies and we stopped at what? Judah. I will praise the Lord. Stopped at Judah. Here's, let me, let me connect Judah to us. In Matthew chapter 1. It is... Matthew chapter 1, that's usually the chapter we all like to skip over. Because all it is is a list of generation, 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 generation. Now, you know what? Get me to the Christmas story. I want to see when Jesus is born. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. 
Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. I just want to stop there for a moment. Notice, in that, it, it wasn't Joseph the coat of many colors. It was not Benjamin who died, who, who, whose mother died at childbirth. It wasn't that. It wasn't these boys. It wasn't the brothers where he favored some and didn't favor none or didn't love Leah or did love Leah or none of that. It was Judah and his brothers. So here we are in the lineage. Go down to Matthew chapter 1 verse 6. Jesse was the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. I'm, I'm telling you this because there is a lineup that takes place from here where it talks about Abraham first of all. Then it gets to Jacob, who we're talking about, that did not love Leah. And through that had Judah. And Judah had some children. And through that children line came King David. And then who had King Solomon. Some of these people we know about. We didn't really recognize Judah, but man, we know about King David and King Solomon. We know Abraham. And then we're down here to uh, verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph. Now this is another Jacob, okay? Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And then the beginning of verse 18 says this. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. Though Leah was unloved, God saw all misery. Though Leah did not have what was connected to Jacob, God saw Leah. And God, I'm telling you, this is, when I talk about, it's not about, it, 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 take away from the love, the sex, the unlove, the trickery, the deceit, the death. Take away from that. And remember what I said. God has always been in all of it. He knew exactly what was to take place. He knew that Leah, who was unloved, would have Judah. And he knew from that there would be come down line, 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 line. And the Messiah would be born. Jesus Christ would be born. God loved Leah so much. It didn't matter if she won the relation, the affection of Jacob. God loved Leah so much. We need to grasp that. God loved Leah so much that through that time and the lineage, we have the Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because God loves you so much. We might be sitting here today going, man, this is a hard day. Or man, there's an illness. Or man, I'm struggling with finances. Or man, I'm struggling with this and that. Or wow, praise the Lord because this is so good. We might be in any of that situation. And know this, God loves you so much more than anything. In all of that, the Messiah is born. God is willing to step in with the Savior in your life so that something is so beautiful can be seen. So that when we walk out of these doors, we know who we are. It doesn't matter if you, if you have to... It's not this. I do not have to have someone to love me. I don't have to have this companion or that companion. Yes, all that's good. But we walk out of here knowing we are not alone because God loves me so much that he sent me Jesus, his son. So I'm going to ask the musicians, musicians to come forward. We're about ready to take communion. See, this is where, uh, you know, when I look at Leah and I look at all that she went through and I look at how the lineage comes down to this. God loved Leah so much and he loves me so much that Jesus died on the cross when I was unloved by the world. See, some of us think that the world loves us. The world just actually wants to be a part of your life or use you. One of those two things. The world does not love you. The world will discard you in a heartbeat, but God never will. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross so that, the, that we might have forgiveness. A simple thing. God, forgive me. When everything else just seems the way it is, you are still there and you still love me. And so I will dedicate myself to loving others. There's areas of scripture that talks about, I believe it's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, that says, we are to motivate those around us to love in works and in, in, in uh, oh, mercy, 
and deeds. We are to motivate people to love. Now, it is not to love like Jacob loved. It is to love like God loves. That is what we're to do. So as we stand and sing this song before we take communion, if you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the one who loves you more than anything, it is a simple thing. Come and pray. I'll pray with you. God, forgive me for where I am and who I am. I need you who loves me more than anything to be the one in my life. And I will not only follow you, but I will tell others about you, how much you love them. Not because it's Valentine's Day, but because you love us always. And help me in that way. Those of us that do know him as that way, it's still, it's still a tall thing in our lives. God, there's going to be circumstances that are going to come up against me. I follow you, but there's going to be something that comes up against me. God, love me. Love me. Because I just need that for a moment. Let's pray and then sing. God, we thank you for this time that we have together. And as we're about to take communion and break bread and, and take of the juice, remembering your blood shed for us, God, that is what we do. We pause for a moment. To remember how much you loved us by dying on the cross for us. God, to draw us closer to you, to bring us into this relationship with you. So that not just for our own self, but so that we can also share the love to people who need to know you, God. Make every opportunity for us as we draw closer to you that we can share your love with others. Not just this day, but always. In Jesus' name, amen. Dead to every world